Is Auto Reframe really that good? What else do we get with version 14.0? Hey, it's Piotr Stoczynski from Cut to the Point. I'm a freelance editor and today I'm gonna give you a quick overview of what's new in Premiere Pro CC 2020. If you want to read about all new updates, including not so hot ones, visit my website, I will link it in the description. Let's cut to the auto reframe feature, which actually was first presented by Adobe in 2018 under the name Project Smooth Operator. Actually, I should change my t-shirt first. That's more appropriate. Auto reframe feature is supposed to automate the task of reframing videos for different aspect ratios. Editors of all kinds create different versions for Instagram stories, Twitter, etc. The effect uses Adobe Sensei machine learning to be able to identify objects that humans find interesting. Basically, they took a lot of pictures and told the computer to analyze how human retina reacts to them and to learn the patterns. We apply auto reframe from effects panel. Luckily it's GPU accelerated and it works really fast. You can also run it for a whole sequence by right clicking and choosing a new option auto reframe sequence. It will duplicate that sequence, change the aspect ratio automatically and apply auto reframe to all of the clips in it. Analysis begins and as a result position keyframes are being created in the intrinsic motion parameter. If you have a long sequence you can continue working during that analysis just like with warp stabilizer. Any graphics are independently resized for each aspect ratio which is pretty impressive. There are three presets we can choose from. Default one is appropriate in most cases, but if you have a scene with fast moving objects within a frame you should choose faster motion preset. And for interviews and shots with very little movement, you should choose slower motion. It generates very few keyframes compared to the other two presets. Two things to note. Remember that auto reframe is designed to be a finishing step. So run the effect when you're done with editing the given sequence. And if you've already applied some motion adjustments to some of the clips in the sequence, you should select the option to nest clips. It will remove transition effects, but will keep your changes to motion parameter. You can see that I tried using it for a few different types of videos. All in all, I think this is a great addition to the toolkit, but I don't think it will do all of the work for you. Sometimes you will need to add or delete keyframes manually. Still, it will save you a lot of time if reframing for other aspect ratios is something you find yourself doing pretty often. They've added improvements to the system compatibility report and this is a great news. Stability is a big concern for a lot of users and this is yet another step to prevent any compatibility issues. On program launch it will notify you about unsupported video drivers, operating system requirements and so on. Moreover it will send you to the website where you can download the most recent drivers or read more about the issue. After installation I got a message about unsupported video card drivers and once I fixed it my system compatibility report is clean. You can also export the report which will be useful if you need to contact support or just ask someone for help. By the way if you struggle with stability in Premiere Pro I have an ebook dedicated to best practices for stable editing process to make your copy of Premiere Pro bulletproof. If that's something you're interested in you can order your copy on Gumroad. There are new shortcuts for keyframe temporal and spatial interpolation. They work both for single and multiple selections of keyframes. Up to this point dealing with keyframes interpolation in Premiere Pro was always a pain in the ass, so I'm really happy that now we can apply it faster with shortcuts. We can also assign a shortcut to enable or disable motion direct manipulation in the program monitor panel. So once you select the clip on the timeline, you can just hit the shortcut you've assigned and transform an object directly in the viewer. Small thing, but it's actually something I wanted to have for years. Good news about time remapping feature. The new maximum speed for time remapping has been increased to 20,000%. Previously it was only 1000% and it was really limiting. Not long ago I made a video about media cache management in Premiere Pro. 
saying that you cannot delete cache files directly in Premiere Pro preferences, but this is no longer the case. Instead of remove unused option that was there before, we now have the delete button. Once we click it, another dialog box appears. And here we can choose to delete all media cache files on the system at the currently chosen location. But it will not delete cache files for currently open project. If you want to delete all media cache files, you need to quit Premiere Pro, relaunch it and open preferences while the home screen is active. So even though my not so old video is a little bit outdated, I'm still happy about this little improvement. Besides, the delete button in the new version will not delete cache files created by older versions of Premiere Pro. Therefore, you can still learn a thing or two from this video, so go ahead and watch it. Drop-down menu support has been added to motion graphic templates. Previously, creators were forced to use sliders and checkboxes to switch between different parameters in their templates. For example, here I have a very powerful shape builder template from guys at Smashworks. I will link it in the description. It uses sliders to switch between different variations and parameters of an animation we're building. And I'm pretty sure that now they will update some of these to use drop-down menu instead. It just offers better user experience. Essential Graphics panel will now have a multi-line edit field for text in motion graphic templates. The edit field will fit three lines of text and if you go over that amount, it has a vertical scroll bar. That's another improvement to motion graphic templates that I wanted to see and it's pretty cool that it works with old templates as well. The range for audio faders and for rubber bands has been increased to plus 15 dBs. Previously the maximum was plus 6 dB, which for me very often was not enough. The master fader also has increased range to maximum of plus 15 dB instead of 0 dB in previous versions. The rubber band for clips and tracks has been moved up a little bit. It should allow for better manipulation of volume across the entire range. So don't be surprised if the line is in a little bit higher position and not in the middle like before. Overall, this is also a long-awaited and much appreciated improvement. There is a set of new shortcuts for working with graphic layers. First, we have shortcuts for selecting layers. They will work when there is an existing graphic layer selected and the program monitor or essential graphics panel is in focus. They will not work if you are in the text editing mode. Speaking of which, we also have a shortcut for entering edit mode on selected text layer. I always felt like we were missing that one, so I'm glad it's here. And to commit text entry, you now press Ctrl plus Enter. And last but not least, we can now reorder layers in stack order with shortcuts that were previously only available for legacy titler. These arrange commands are also available in graphics menu. Now that you know about all of these new features, watch my video about 5 secrets in Premiere Pro you may not know about. What's my take on the new release? I expected more. Auto reframe is actually the only new feature and everyone was expecting it already. Don't get me wrong, I'm very happy about most of these improvements, but seeing resolve with features like sync bin and so on, I just wish Adobe would gamble on something as well. Smash subscribe, hit the bell, like the video and see you next time.